I'll give you a little bit of background. Um, so this project was a my PhD, uh, which is technically in sociology, uh, which is arguably more hilarious because uh, there wasn't anyone in the sociology department who really was able to supervise my work that well. And that's how I ended up with a physicist as a supervisor. And I'm the only sociologist he's ever supervised, which is kind of hilarious. Um, and so, and again, it was his research group that, that was crucial for me to be able to go through all of this technical stuff in a way that I would actually be able to get some results. Um, so if that hadn't happened, I probably wouldn't have finished my PhD. Um, so, uh, but, you know, there's finishing the PhD and then there's publishing it. Those are different tasks and various other things kind of had to take over. Um, and so uh, my supervisor and I have finally decided let's go back and see if we can finally get a paper out of that. So that was part of the, the way of uh, in forcing myself to keep going with it and, and to present at this conference and a, and a conference on social network analysis, which was last week. So this is a, you know, this is a very technical side of it, whereas the presentation before was very much the, the, the results, the analytical results. Um, but I, I figured this might be help, interesting for other people in the Python community, um, and particularly if, if people have old projects that they need to um, kind of return to and get up and working again. So um, I call it resurrecting because it was very much a sort of left in stasis kind of situation from a few years ago. Um, and uh, of course, many libraries have changed. Um, and this is only looking at the Python side of it. Um, a lot of the analysis ended up uh, being in R as well. So there was quite a lot of back and forth between um, the database in Python using uh, Django's ORM, specifically the GeoDjango ORM. Um, in retrospect, um, post GIS uh, using um, the SQL Alchemy GIS, I think it's GeoAlchemy package would have been another option that um, I kind of wish I had gone for in some ways, but I found so much more documentation of GeoDjango and that was one reason why I stuck with it. Um, and I guess uh, the possibility of maybe one day releasing the results in a way that other people could then look at the data was, was part of that motivation. So maybe one day, um, but, um, but you know, at the time I went with Django uh, and it was still, uh, when I started, which gosh, part of it actually went back to my master's, which was back in 2008. So that was fairly early days by Django standards. Um, and the geo Django stuff was very recently coming out. Um, and, uh, so that was back under Django one, I think maybe 1.3 three or four or something like that. So if we fast forward to 2014, which is when I finally handed in my thesis, uh, uh, Django, I think had gotten up to 1.11, but I had gotten so worried about getting the results that, um, you know, it was still kind of Django 1.7, um, which we'll get to in the initial state bit. Um, and uh, a lot of the libraries were kind of, uh, should have been updated. My test structure, which I'd done with nose, was not done very well. And uh, so there were still tests that weren't passing. They were taking hours to run. Um, and my supervisor, not being a software developer, <laughs> was mostly concerned about getting the results published. So uh, things got really hacky towards the end. Um, so I'll, I'll just give you a, a, a a brief further context, it was on analyzing the geographic spread of this community um, and this map at the back. Uh, let's see if I can zoom in on that. Um, uh, maybe not. Yeah, so each of these dots, uh, the circle is the number of people running bulletin board systems, which were very early kind of social network communities in which people would literally act as a server on their home computer um, and publish times that other people could connect to them. And then they would save messages that other people could read. And they tried to keep the list of phone numbers that you could call to connect updated every Friday. So that's a time series of the change in this community going back to at least 1983. 
So that's weak level changes in a community that I studied. Uh, I think I finally left the data at about 2012. So we're talking almost three decades uh, of, of for large sections, weak level changes in a community structure. Um, and so each of these circles is uh, the coordinates of a US telephone exchange and the number of servers uh, that are being run uh, with numbers that are through that exchange. So it's a little bit misleading because it looks like Washington State up in the top left corner, uh, I assume maybe you can see my mouse, uh, is like massive uh, compared to say uh, California. Um, but it's actually probably because there are so many more telephone exchanges in California. So this is actually a much higher density of, of places. It's just that they aren't all going through the same, tel same telephone exchange. So they all show up in the same place. So um, to process all that information to geographic, um, I, I used GeoDjango, which allows me to use PostGIS for, so I could run spatial queries. Um, and, uh, and so it ended up being a Django project. Um, and then from that, you know, constructing that data set alongside US census data, which is also very geographic, so I could get the demographics of the different regions. I could try to model how much the, the demographic features uh, were important in the spread and then the decline of this social network. Um, and I'll, I'll just give you another slightly brief kind of delve into the context. Uh, this is, I hope you can see this, um, uh, the, uh, so FidoNet was the name of the, of the community. Um, there were a number of other bulletin board systems or BBSs, uh, but FidoNet was, was probably the most global. It actually covered all six inhabitable continents in varying degrees. I actually have plots of that if you're interested. Um, and, uh, and so this was back in sending text. So there was actually some fascinating parts of the project in which they were trying to do, deal with different character encodings before Unicode. Um, and uh, so I won't go into all of that, uh, but that was, that, was, that was the project. I think it's a really interesting topic. It's a really good documentary and I've met the guy who made the documentary. I've also met one of the people who wrote a lot of the core code that, that the, the system was founded on. And this little logo here by John Medill was the original logo of FighterNet. So that's the context of what I'm studying. So, um, so in creating all of this, I used Django. There were two main data sets. One was the, uh, the list of telephone uh, numbers. And actually, I can go into, you know what, why don't, why don't I, why don't I uh, alter my, well, OK, maybe I can go back to that. Um, I can show you the list actually of telephone numbers in the, in the file format. Maybe what I can do is just quickly um, show some of that. So this is a presentation I gave uh, at a network social network analysis conference called Sun. Belt. Um, so yeah, I hope you can see this. This is an example of uh, the data structure that I was processing. Um, and so uh, <laughs> I could give you a talk on regular expressions <laughs> if you like. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so this is a very uh, hierarchical routing structure. Um, there were actually zones for continents and then regions within continents, in this case, Eastern Canada, uh, and then uh, sort of nodes that were geographically local to that particular region number, uh, and then another hierarchy of hosts um, within that, and then underneath hosts, there's another hierarchy of hubs. So you can see this is sort of the easier, more standardized level of data. The, the much earlier stuff is, is really, really complicated and just use commas and spaces, but not in a clear structured way. There are a lot of asterisks to account for more international numbers because originally it was just US numbers. Anyway, so it was a lot of processing that went into that and that then led to um, you know, the data set. Um, and then uh, I, I want to show you this here. There's also US census data, which can give you demographic features down to approximately 8,000 people. And they'll give you the uh, shape of those uh, as in a shape file. 
which I could then process with GeoDjango, and I, I effectively created, uh, maybe I could show you that somewhere else. Yeah. Um, so each of these uh, lines in this structure is a region that we could get geographic information on. Uh, and then these dots are the coordinates of the US telephone exchanges. Um, and so I combine the telephone exchanges around areas that I could get demographic information on. And of course, there are some awkward edge cases uh, around lakes. Um, and so I constructed my units of analysis with about 16,000 areas. Um, and then I could look at when each area, if they did, adopted. And controlling for demographic factors to what extent spatial proximity helped predict joining the fighter net community. So that was that was the idea, and that was the sort of data that needed to be processed in a structured way. So um, I can actually <laughs> uh, briefly show you. Um, uh, let's see uh, the um, yeah. So, hope this shows up. This is the database hierarchy of tables um, that I constructed. This was also one of my first big programming projects. So I'm guessing there are many people who think this should be done in different ways. People argue about the best way to do uh, database structures. Feel free to criticize me on that. Um, that's, this was really my first big dive into programming, um, at, at least on this level of, of project. So, um, you know, I'm, what I'm showing you here is the node time point. So I was trying to look at the time points of each uh, activity at uh, a regional level, which I could then get from 1990 US Census data. Um, and uh, there are different, there are tracks and census blocks trying to handle those different hierarchies. And then there was another, which is the NHGIS um, data, which uh, was another regional amount uh, for larger areas um, where you can get more detailed Im demographic information, which is also related to this IPOMS thing. And so, you know, there were certain things like age and uh, occupation, which I think we could only get at the larger area level. Uh, and then uh, there were other bits of data that we could get on a more finer grained level. So we had to do a weighted structure of all of that information to kind of characterize all these regions and how much that might make a difference uh, in uh, modeling this, this community spread. Um, and then getting the geographic information from area codes and the census tract uh, area codes and the coordinates of US uh, area code regions. Anyway. So this is this is just a glimpse at the, the the database structure that all of this was stored under uh, to then effectively get a sense of the network uh, as it was expanding uh, and then uh, um, you know try to get the data right and and I guess that's another crucial thing to, to point out what I've done is much more feasible in a research context where you you know it's not like a classic Django project where you have a bunch of users and uh, they are, um, uh, you know, you need to have something that's uh, providing that service on a consistent basis. You know, I can rerun the whole thing. I can drop the database, make sure my answers are right. You know, I, I, I didn't have, you know, the, the classic situation of providing a Django site as a service to users. So that, that gave me more flexibility. And given how difficult I found this project, I, I shudder to imagine what it's like um, if you're running your own Django site without a whole team of other people to help with that transition process. So that's all the background. Um, and so I'm going to dive back into this. Um, so let's, it's interesting uh, planning this whole share thing. So I'm hoping this is working. Okay, cool. So I think we're back to my poster. So with all of that context, uh, I'm going to start with the, the preamble. Uh, I assume you've heard of PEP8, um, which is about making your code as clear as possible. Um, and uh, clearly written code, documented, 
tested. Um, if you haven't looked at it in years and you come back to it, I cannot express how crucial that is. Um, and even, you know, stylistic uh, sort of linter packages, and there are others that I'll come blanking on some of the names that are kind of, you know, I'm just initially running that on my code base and suggesting, why did you just name that variable one character? And then I can't even remember what that variable was doing. And it forced me to read label it into a, a clearer readable way. I, it's, it's absolutely crucial. Um, and I found that difficult to express that to my supervisor. I think to some extent, uh, some of the research expectations aren't as stringent as I guess production level, you know, projects where you're providing a service. Um, but the more I tested and documented it in a structured way, and there were some downsides to the testing, which I'll get to in a bit, um, I, I couldn't have gotten anywhere without that. So huge like reason why I find Python to be a great language. Um, so at that, uh, with all of that preamble, um, the initial state for this was, uh, this was a project back with uh, Python 2.7.5, um, Django 1.7, uh, uh, Django Nose, which is a test running framework, um, which is built on Nose, which is considerably less popular. I think even the main Nose branch hasn't been updated in a year, but I, I, I can't look at that. Um, there was a new, uh, excuse me, package which was brought into Django um, at core after that um, called South, uh, which is for managing migrations, another very crucial potential aspect of a project like this. Um, so I think I had installed South um, in anticipation of needing to mess with it, um, but you know it's it's just part of Django core from 2.0. Uh, Postgres SQL 9.4, I remember how difficult it was getting from Postgres 8 to 9, and even some of the transitions between 9, whew, that was really hard. Um, so in anticipation of that, and the PostGIS project, uh, and I, I mentioned there's a link in here to post on GIS.com, uh, sorry, bostongis.com uh, for demonstrating how you, ha you can't just do a classic upgrade, you have to do a dump and then process it to feed it back in. It's very easy to make a mistake doing that, at least I found that, so uh, I'll come back to that in a bit. And then two, uh, there were other libraries, but those were two of the more important ones for my data structure. Django tree beard, uh, which uh, is, is a really interesting, efficient way to make a hierarchical tree structure, which is how I could keep track of the networking information that I was trying to show you in that diagram before. Uh, and tag it, which is still, I think, supports even Django 1.11 all the way up to Django 3, which is a fascinating example of a project that's managed to go between different versions of Python and, and still maintain that far back. Um, so anyway, so that, that was the initial state. Um, so that's, that's zero and then, uh, taking Python indexing style. So to prepare, um, for the process, the first thing I did was I updated Python 2.7.5 to 2.7.18. That was, that was the easy part. I mean, I think, uh, it involved, so originally it was a virtually in V and I think I've now shifted to doing most of my stuff in Pippi and V. Uh, I could have put that information here. Um, but yeah, kind of making that first shift to the latest version of Python, Python 2.7. Um, then this PG dump, this Postgres SQL dump, uh, that's a, uh, <laughs> again, not providing a live service. That was my way of having a, a safety uh, safe space to return to. Um, I haven't put this here, but I put timestamps on all of the dumps as a way of file names as a like being able to keep track when I, I can't remember how many dumps I, I used in this process. <laughs> um, uh, that'll, that'll be a reoccurring theme. Um, so returning to my test coverage and it was at least 80 80 something tests, it would take at least four hours to run. There were some things that I was already trying to change back then that those tests weren't passing. So it was re it's really hard to come back to a project that's in such a kind of fragmented state 
Uh, so you're not even sure what's what's right and what's wrong. And going back through it after years can, can be hard. Um, so I, I tried to sort of l reduce the set of tests, tests to adhere to um, so that uh, it was, you know, more manageable and just how long it would take. I mean, you know, you change one thing and it, if it takes four hours to run the test to see if it worked. And obviously you can, you can drill down uh, this particular test, um, make sure that test works fine, do a commit, then try and run the whole thing. But even that point where you're trying to run the whole thing, and often it would be a case of, oh, I thought I fixed something here. Uh, oh, but now this other thing doesn't work. How do I, you know, make sure, anyway. So I, my, my strategy for that, and I think there are pros and cons to this, was to kind of narrow down the list of tests to cover uh, and then just stick with that to keep going. Um, and, uh, you know, we'll see. I, I think that was a good strategy. I'm, I'm glad with how far I've gotten, but it could be further down the road that there's some other core mistakes that some of those tests were covering that I, I have not sorted yet, but we shall see. Um, and then just updating those two packages, which again, thankfully, uh, are so like supportive across multiple regions of Python that I could, I could basically do a big leap on those uh, without having to worry about the different, different versions of Python uh, beyond that. So that was, that was the easy part. Uh, and then the comparatively minor stuff. Uh, so I added PyTest, which mostly supports the same syntax structure for nose tests. Um, I think three, yeah, I, I, I think I tried, I went to some length to make sure I, I remembered the, I put down the right number of versions, uh, but Django PyTest uh, seemed like a uh, better option. Um, oh, I just got a message. I'm not sure what that's referring to. Um, but uh, yeah, so um, I used uh, that as a, as a, it's, it's much more maintained the nose. That was a much better way to, uh, to manage the tests. And it's mostly compatible with the way that you can write tests for nose. That was another kind of pruning set of tests to adhere to. Um, and then I did the first uh, Postgres and PostGIS upgrades. Um, and uh, those, again, I dumped and then did an import. I think I stuck with Postgres SQL uh, nine to 10 first. I think that was the hardest with PostGIS. And I think it's much easier to update PostgreSQL versions, PostgreSQL versions since 10. Uh, at least that's been my experience. Um, there's a link there. I can put that in the chat if you like of the, uh, the, the Boston GIS examples from PostGIS. And I see I'm actually coming up to uh, running out of time, which is kind of ironic. So I'll, I'll just keep going quickly. Uh, within Python 2, uh, the last supported version of Django is 1.11.29, I think. So that was the minor upgrade section. Um, I then got to the actual <laughs> uh, shift in Python. And this was a very long, complicated process um, to get uh, I, Python future um, and futurize ended up being the the tack I went with. There is another version called modernize, which I uh, has has a nice kind of if you decide to just go for Python three rather than trying to maintain compatibility across Python two and Python three. Uh, but modernize isn't that well maintained anymore, um, and uh, Python future as a package is trying to cover so many different options. It's worth looking through that documentation, um, and and then I, you know. Again, this is a significant summary, but having structured all of those packages as much as I could that were compatible across Python 2 and Python 3, that was when I sh did the shift. Uh, and um, yeah, so, so that got me up to, and it's crucial to say, I didn't go all the way to, to Django 3, I went to Django 2, um, and because there was more documentation on that, but I, I jumped to the, to the latest version of Django, so that's 2.2. 13. Um, and there were some other crucial differences between the libraries, not just, you know, Python uh, 2 versus 3 syntax. The ORM uses a cascade. You know, it's, it's, it's shifted more to the SQL alchemy structure of being much more explicit about some of the SQL com components. 
Um, but, uh, and then, you know, uh, south was completely gone. I didn't need that anymore. I could use the migration structures that was now, that was originally south and part of Django core. Um, and then uh, I could upgrade to 2.2.313, having fixed the syntax. And the, the I found, at least in my cases, again, I had zero front end to worry about. So I think a lot of the other changes I might have had to deal with, if this was a normal, you know, web app project, then that, that probably been, would have been more painful. Um, but uh, from 2.2 to 3.0, that was comparatively trivial. Um, there's a useful thing to look up on the save function on models. Um, wasn't that big a deal to me, but again, on the back end, I, I, that, there's a, in the slide, there's a link to that documentation. Um, and then I, I decided to just sort of tick the rest of the boxes, removing those, um, shifting Postgres SQL up to 12.3 and PostGIS to 3.0. Um, there were some other details. It's, it's now all Dockerized rather than worrying about which server versions I'd be worrying about, but, um, but yeah. So, so that was the project. I realized I went into a lot of detail at the beginning and then had to go through the other stuff, which might have been more useful very quickly later. Um, but uh, I'm happy for any questions. Uh, and um, I can also go to the discourse chat if that's easier. Um, and uh, thank you very much for listening. Um, and happy to answer any questions. Thanks a lot, Paul. It was quite sure. a lot. <laughs> yeah, this is why I had proposed this originally as a long talk because <laughs> even this is a uh, is less than I had originally planned to cover. <laughs> so uh, I can I can see why I I wasn't sure how to squeeze it into a thirty minute option. Um, but I'm glad you know it's very nice to have a chance to present it anyway. And of course, if you have any questions, we could also go to Discord if, if you'd rather. Um, it seems like I don't have the option of doing a normal chat function within Zoom here. Otherwise, I would have suggested that. Um, and obviously, you're welcome to just switch your microphone on if, if you want to just talk. No, sorry, I haven't really prepared which question. <laughs> oh, that's fine. That's fine. <laughs> Um, well, uh, I could go into a bit more detail about um, any of the sections, if there's uh, any part that would be, that comes to mind. Um, Probably the switch between Python 2 and Python 3. That's yeah, that, that's the hardest part. <laughs> um, yeah, so, um, the the crucial thing um so there's you know there there's the 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 python porting options the the two to three package is is pretty good there's reasons people have sort of added stuff on top of it but um but yeah that's a that's a nice element and what i also found helpful was the fact that there is quite a lot of overlap, like print, for example, uh, uh, of, of syntactic similarity between 2.7 and, and 3.5. So I actually, I started with just the print statements <laughs> as, a, um, as a kind of test example to see if what I was doing made sense. And that meant at least for some of that, I could run old tests in 2.7 as a kind of stop gap um, while uh, uh, trying to uh, make sure that what I was doing was right. Um, 
so that was the first big hurdle. Uh, and that's what, you know, two to three is a, is a kind of classic example for, uh, is, is fixing your print statements. Um, the <laughs> X range versus range <laughs> stuff, uh, that, that was a lot harder. Um, and so that was where, you know, because you, you have the, arguably this, this, it's, it's, it's like maintaining two code bases. There's the base of your tests and then the base of what you're trying to execute. And so you have, I had the, the problem of my tests breaking, not because they were necessarily, uh, you know, because necessarily the actual main code was wrong, but I may have broken the text, the test, but not, not the main body of the code. Um, and that was, that was really hard. Um, so, yeah, um, I recommend uh, the Futurize option. That's that's the one that kind of got me most of the way. Um, I think it it still is is trying to to help with maintaining something that goes across Python two and Python three. Um, whereas Modernize, I think, was pushing for a more strict just three option, um, but Futurize, I found the most helpful kind of wrapper around two to three, um, and uh, and it's 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 a complicated pro project Python dash future, um, and I'm actually sorry I, I don't know if you can load this up but the the links I've got here go to different sections of the documentation. For some reason I couldn't include the the anchor links on these, for some reason, the export to PDF, those were getting all fuzzied up. So it's just jumping to the to the top of those pages. So you kind of need to scroll down to the more helpful sections. Um, but uh, but yeah, that um, component, uh, the the futurize sort of automation and ex you know, you've got some extra options. I didn't go with the extra options. I went with the kind of vanilla flavor of Futurize and then kind of had to go through various sections and fix some things. And I had to be quite precious and, and or sorry, the opposite of precious. I had to be quite sort of brutal and I can't remember what that does. I can't be sure if it's crucial. For the moment, I'm gonna keep going and stick with the stuff that seems mostly covered by the text tests. This is where also stuff like MyPy and coverage ended up actually being really helpful. I don't know if, if those are familiar. MyPy is a way of type checking. Um, that was also partly a way of keeping track of what was that function supposed to do? I know, I'll guess what type it's supposed to be. <laughs> um, uh, and and try to force that. So I, I have, again, for the sake of readability in this presentation, uh, uh, not covered all of those details. Um, but, but yeah, so coupling that with, um, like I, I have various Python extensions within Vim, which is the way that I write code. And so it was raising warnings if I hadn't type hinted sections or if I had just raised an exception without a specific type of exception. So lots of those details um, that would just flare up every time I would make an edit um, and as a way of, of, of forcing things to be specific uh, and as, as type checked and correct as possible. Those were all elements of that process. Um, for me. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I guess I think we in theory end in about six minutes, but um, I'm trying to think if there's another way I could go into more detail. Um, but I, maybe, maybe the first question is, is that, is that at least helping answer that for you? Um, I can try and see if I can actually find some of the code sections. I just, sorry, I didn't think that that would come up now and that might take a little bit of time and I'm worried we won't be able to, to get to something useful uh, before I'm supposed to shut down. Um, but yeah, does, does that in part help answer your question? Um, yeah, that was approximately what I had in mind. Another question, uh, how long those, uh, did those four phases take? 
So how much time? <laughs> um, the first few were like a couple of weeks. Um, and, you know, it's hard. It's also having a bunch of other things I'm doing alongside it. Um, and so it's, it's hard to like, it's, it's hard to kind of talk about that. Uh, this <laughs> step three, <laughs> and again, this is with other, other projects. That was, that was a month. Uh, it's a very intense month. Uh, and, um, again, you know, if this was a, a project to, you know, maintain something for a service for people throughout, uh, I think you need a team to do something like that personally. I mean, of course there are developers out there who can presumably do some of this very straightforwardly. They know their code that well, especially if they've been connected to it for a while and it's not so sprawled and from years ago, but yeah, that was, that was a month. Uh, and not doing that much else. Uh, and I found it very frustrating, uh, and very complicated. Uh, but it was very, <laughs> it was quite a relief to actually get through. I, I, I think if it's helpful to say maybe three weeks in, I, I'd almost given up. <laughs> it took my supervisor's kind of encouragement to keep me going. Um, and, and yeah, I think I also often kind of, uh, didn't trust something when it initially just seemed to not work. Um, and I think it, it was also because of my more recent projects have all been Python three. So my brain going back and forth between Python three ish syntax and Python two ish syntax, um, I would often get frustrated and think I'd, you know, made a really terrible mistake and actually it was usually a really small syntax mistake but it could be really hard to find but once i did and then it was sort of like oh it wasn't actually that big a problem it was just a really annoying you know typo okay i can keep going this is going to work out um i realize that's quite abstract um but uh yeah so 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 that was that was a month and then the other stuff has been that's that's been about a couple of weeks we're not really done with that yet so and it's sort of like the irony of, of doing ar arguably the hardest part which was phase three and now actually trying to check the results which is phase four but then having a whole bunch of other projects that i have to get done has kind of put that on pause so um it seems like stage four is is fine but we'll see when i actually get down to the results which i have to now ex then export to r um if we actually get numbers that we like so it seems like four is the easy part but i don't know <laughs> i feel like I, I could answer that in a month maybe more more accurately because it's not really done yet um but but at least those components of it like fixing the testing structure getting rid of nodes going up to uh push gis3 um all of that stuff i'm I'm quite proud of, and, and once it was just three, rather than jumping between Python 2 and Python 3, that, that was much easier for me, partly just conceptually, because I didn't have to keep trying to remember which version of what. I guess the other thing I haven't mentioned is I have a lot of Git forks in doing this, so uh, trying to be very, uh, kind of retain a base that was, I knew working, and then fork from that until I was happy with that fork and then merge that back into main or sometimes, you know, many, many forks that merge back together to finally get to main. Um, yeah. And I'm also really sorry. I can't show you that project. My supervisor is really keen to get this published and his approach to that is to, um, is to not have it released until we actually get a draft of a paper to a journal. Otherwise I, you know, would have a repository to just point at for stuff. Um, but yeah. Thanks. That has been very interesting. <laughs> sure. Thank you for thank you for being here. Um, and it's very helpful to to speak to someone. And if you have any suggestions on uh, how to present a poster, because I haven't done that very much before. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, I hope I hope this worked for you. And and yeah, if the you know. Uh, my email address is, I mean, you can see my 
I don't use Twitter that much, but I'm Griff underscore Reese. And my email address at Sheffield is griffith.reese at sheffield.ac.uk. Um, so if, if you've got some more questions, uh, especially if you've got, you know, specific sections of code I can try to take a look at, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to help. Um, and I think that means that we're supposed to leave the room. Um, I am also scheduled to try to give a very quick lightning talk for a very different project. Um, so uh, maybe see you for that. Um, and I will also shift to that channel in uh, Discord uh, in case um, you or anyone else have things to chat about there. Um, Thanks a lot. Bye. Sure. Thank you very much. Yeah.